Please, and I want to ask each and every one of us, please, let's be patient, even as we listen to this glorious uh, message. You know, the theme of this whole family service that we have put together is called the marriage template. You know, and uh, if the slides are on, um, I don't know, first of all, we'll be looking at the foundational principles of marriage. Because in Psalm 11 verse 3, the scripture tells us that it says, if the foundation be destroyed, so what can the righteous do? Then we also look at the marriage template itself. We'll be looking at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 20 through 25. And um, we'll also be looking at what I call marital storms. We must understand that, you know, the enemy is moving around like a royal lion seeking whom he may devour. You find out that a, uh, a lot of marriages are passed through difficult seasons, you know, stormy situations. But I want to tell you something. God builds marriages. But as God is trying to build, Satan is trying to destroy. So that's why it's imperative for us as Christians. We need to be sober. We need to be vigilant so that we can easily discern, you know, the wiles of the enemy. You know, the scripture tells us that a man shall leave his father and mother you see, and the two shall become what? One flesh. But we also look at how do we become one flesh? You know, arithmetic says one plus one is equal to two. But in marriage, one plus one is equal to one. You know, you know marriage also has mathematics to it. Do you understand that? It's either your spouse is adding to you or subtracting from you. It's either your spouse is multiplying you or dividing you. Do you understand that? So, give me, let's look at Genesis chapter 2. Let's go to uh, uh, this slide. The very, let's go to the, uh, uh, the, the, the very foundation of marriage. Because marriage, we must understand, is God's idea. It's not man. If you look at Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 to 24. Genesis 2, 21 to 24. Very quickly. Is it, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. Verse, he said, And the reed which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. He said, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Verse 24. We we'll stop there. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall become what? One flesh. If you look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 22, the scripture says that, you know, it says God brought the woman to the man. Do you understand? Why did God bring the woman to the man? Because God knows that marriage is such a complex institution, it's such a delicate decision that you cannot make by yourself. You see, and the woman waited you know, for God to bring her to the man. The question I want to ask each and every one of you right now, did God bring your wife to you? And for the woman, did you wait for God to take you to your husband? And that's why today the marriage institution is in disarray. You know, have you ever asked yourself a question? I don't know if you, you know couples who are in their 60s, they've been married for over 30 years, they have children, they have grandchildren, and now they are spending all their retirement funds in the divorce court. This is the time that they should be enjoying themselves, the time that they should be traveling all over the world, but right now, they are embroiled in, in the divorce court. They are spending all their money that they have gathered over time to divorce lawyers. And those divorce lawyers are encouraging them, saying, you know what, you need to divorce. My brother, my sister, I've been married for 29 years, thank God. <laughs> but one thing I want to tell you, marriage is a tough terrain, even as pastors. Because you just imagine somebody that grew up in a different home with different parents. You grew up in another home with different parents. You may, probably you went to different schools. If you went to the same school, maybe at different times in your life, and you now come together, you want to live in the same house. Of course, there will be differences. Do we agree? Is there anyone here who is married who does not have a difference with whether with the husband or the wife. If you tell me you don't have a difference with that, I will tell you something, you don't live in the same house. And you know one thing about marriage is that, you know, social media is a horrible liar. You know, I've seen couples, they will post on Facebook, 
My dear husband, my dear wife, the next day I'm in their house settling a quarrel. I've seen. I'm telling you. Belinda and Bigos, multi-billionaires, traveling all over the world, you know, present the front that was never real, but we are there today divorced after having children and grandchildren. So my brother and my sister, we need to understand that the foundation of marriage is God and God alone. You cannot do it without God. I've heard people say you can change somebody. You can't help somebody discover their identity in Christ. It's only God that can help the person. And if somebody has not discovered the identity of Christ, I'm telling you, at the get married, there will be a crisis. Because as a pastor, I have counseled a lot of married couples. And most of the things I've said is that, you know, is the foundation is fractured. So you must understand the one thing is that people don't understand that marriage is a covenant. It's not a contract. Do you understand the difference between a covenant and a contract? A covenant is initiated by God a contract is initiated by man. Why do men initiate contracts? Men initiate contracts because they don't trust one another. Do you understand? We don't trust each other. So we have to put it in writing so that if there's a disagreement, you know, we can go back to the contract and say, this is what we agreed to do. But marriage is not a contract. Marriage is a covenant. You know, and only a covenant can only be initiated by God. If you have the understanding that your, your spouse, your covenant partner, my brother, my sister, you will, you will stop treating that marriage situation with levity. You know, a, con a covenant is based on trust in God. But a contract is based on the fact that men do not trust each other. And so they have to put everything in writing. But do you know right now, people go into what they call prenuptials. Is that, is that what I say? So it's, uh, prenuptial, I don't know, sorry, I don't know uh, what a prenuptial, um, um, exactly. You have to write it down. So, okay, if, if, if we divorce, this is what you will get. This is what I will uh, get, exactly. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So, we must understand the marriage template is taken from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 20 through 25. Ephesians chapter 5, 20 through 25, can you give me that? It says, give it thanks for all things unto God. No, Ephesians chapter 5, yes. Give it thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, listen, it says submitting to one another in the fear of God. Listen, why? It says submit to your own husband as to the Lord. It says for the husband is head of the wife as also Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, it says so let the wives be to their husband in Everything. He said, Husband, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Let's stop there and let's go back to my slide. If you look at this scripture very carefully, there are three components that are paramount. The first is, let's look at the first. The first one is, we must submit to each other and to the will of God, in the fear of the Lord. Do you get a point? Because usually, you know, if, if, there's, if there's a disagreement between the husband and the wife, and you bring the husband in, the husband will say, look, you know, you are not submissive to me. And the wife will say, you do not love me. And the man will go back and say again, I will not love you until you submit to me. So it's almost like the chicken and the egg. Which came first? <laughs> so, but the problem is that the, the foundational thing is that there will be mutual submission to each other, to the will of God. If that is not in existence, then you cannot expect the wife to submit to the husband. Because women will not submit to a man who does not fear the Lord. A lot of men would not like to hear this. But that's the truth. So first of all, the first principles is that there must be mutual submission to each other and to God. Once that is established, then it becomes easy for a woman to submit to a godly man. 
But don't get me wrong, there are some women that are demonic. And it's saying that the man is godly and yet they are rebels, they are very rebellious. I know of a woman, you know, not that I know of a woman, somebody, a pastor shared a story with us of a woman who is a pastor's wife. You know, anytime this woman wants to manipulate this man, he denies this man of sex. I say, yes, I won't give it to you. Let me see whether you go as you are a pastor. That's, that's demonic. When you begin to use sex as a bargaining tool. But then, if the woman is submissive, the, the scripture is also admonishing us as men. It says, husband, love your wives. I tell you something. For women, I'm a man, and I'm a pastor. If you love your wife, you know, she will fulfill her potential. Because love heals everything. Love provides an atmosphere, an environment for women to try. If you see a woman who is always looking haggard, a woman who is not settled, that there's something wrong. The home is not settled. Because for those of us that come from Africa, I don't know if it happens here. You know, during um, Christmas seasons, Easter, you know, we normally take the chicken and we cut off the head. When you cut off the head, what happens to the body? Chicken. And that's what's happening right now. But if you see a woman that is together, spiritually and otherwise, you know that she's enjoying the love of her husband. And husband, we need to, you know, man, you are the man of the home. You need to take leadership. You need to lead your home, spiritually and otherwise. That's why, but you see, in a lot of, what, especially in the church of God, what happens right now is that a lot of men, they have abdicated their responsibility and given their wives. When it comes to spiritual matters, they say, you are the prayer champion. You lead the prayer. You do everything. But that is not, that is not the way God has ordained it. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3. It says, For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. My brother, my sister, and women, I'm talking to all of you, all my daughters in here, please, do not take over the responsibility of your husband's. The husband is the head of the home. And men, all my sons, please lead your homes, spiritually and otherwise. Because, you see, one thing again that if the church of God is in crisis, if, this, if, the, if the society at large is in crisis, the, the, the reason responsible for that is that the family unit is not together. A family that is dysfunctional, you know, you know can never fulfill its potential. Do we all agree? So are we all making that commitment today that we'll go back home and ensure that our families, you know, will not operate in the way God has ordained it to be? I don't know how many people made the declaration when I say hold your wife, hold your family, one accord. How many people made those declarations? How many people did not make it? And how many of us are not telling the truth? Don't, you see, when I make such declarations, I know what I'm talking about. A home that is peaceful will be impactful. If you look at Genesis chapter 11, verse 6, Genesis 11, verse 6, let's quickly look at that. And I want to get this an assignment for each other. It says, and the Lord said, indeed, the people are one, and they have one language. He said, and this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing they propose to do will be withheld from them. And I'm telling you, if you hold your hands with your wife, or your husband, and your children, and you put those prayer points at the family altar, there's nothing that will be impossible to you. But the reason why things are not working for us is that Satan has crept in into the family unit and has introduced what I call the devil of strife. Because strife is demonic. You find out that at the end of the day that trivial things will start causing issues between couples. Trivial things. You know, what happened? You ask a couple, what happened? The diaper, why did you not take the diaper away from there and put it in the, the, the and because that you want to scatter the whole family because of the diaper. Next slide. And I'm running very quickly. Marita Storm. There are tools that are used by Satan to destroy families. Now, what I call a faulty foundation. Psalm 11 verse 3. Say, if the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If you're married here and the foundation, your foundation is not godly, I tell you something, that marriage can never experience the mercies and the miracles of God. And that's why it is, it is imperative for us to go back to the first principles. The first principle we must ensure that, you know, in our home, 
the foundation itself is godly. That's why Matthew chapter 6, 33 and 34. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6, 33 and 34. He said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He said, and all these things shall be what? Added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own pain. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Like I said before, a lot of us marry for the now and not for the future. Like my brother said, uh, Tolu said, he said, when you meet the girl or you meet the guy, there's, there's so much butterfly in your, your stomach. You understand? Say, say, this is the person. It happened to me. You know, when I met my wife, I, I remember, I, I recall, I was a brand manager in, for those of us in Nigeria very well, so really. And she, was, she had an apartment in Surulay that time. I would just, every evening after work, I would just drive to her, I would just to look at her face. <laughs> Nothing in the room. <laughs> but you see, at the end of the day, there are a lot of all those butterflies in your stomach. Then you say, well, this person wants to marry. Everybody's telling you, don't marry this person, don't marry this person, this person is not good for you. You, don't, you are not listening to anybody anymore. Then you marry the person, and two or three years down the road, you start having terrible issues. You know? And I tell you something, if you marry somebody who does not know God, you are in trouble. Because difficulties will come, challenges will come, because life is full of seasons. You know, when my, when my wife met me, I was doing very well as a young man. I had my own apartment, I had two cars, I had a Mercedes, I had a BMW. You know, I was a chartered accountant, or I'm still a chartered accountant, everything. You know, you know I work in the bank, you know. I had money. But at some point, I lost everything. Thank God she didn't uh, leave me, you know. But thank God that God has restored me back. You know what I'm trying to say? That life is full of seasons. The person that has so much today, maybe by tomorrow will not even have anything. But what you need is the spirit of God on the person. That's why uh, when Pharaoh and, and his servants, they met with Joseph, he said, is there anyone of this, a man in whom what is the spirit of God? What you need for is the spirit of God. Not good looking. Because it can be very, you know, we all have that model. Tall, dark, and handsome. Is that not so? But the day it starts slapping you, we forget whether it's tall, whether it's dark, whether it's handsome. Everybody's laughing, you know. You know, there was a time, I mentioned, uh, was it uh, Chloe? Is it Chloe Kardashian or what was that? Uh, Chloe, oh, sorry. Then my daughter asked me, do you know? Do you know? I said, you think, you think I'm a fool? I don't know anything. <laughs> Do you know Chloe? Do you know what's the other one again? Uh, I bet sure that what's the other one again? Uh, um, Angela, Angela, Angelina Jolie. I said, ah, baby, I said, so then you know Angelina Jolie. Hey, so me, I, Pastor, don't get I don't they look. <laughs> you know, so, but, this, but let, no, let's say the way it is. Let's be frank with ourselves. I'm telling you, it's good. I like, I mean, I will tell you, one of the things that attracted me to my wife was she was beautiful. Honestly, she's beautiful. Oh, she's still beautiful. Thank you. No, she, if you had seen my wife at 25, look at my wedding pictures. I was looking so lean, like, like somebody who had just come from, sorry, I don't want to mention the country. Yeah. <laughs> then, you know, what I'm trying to say is the fact that, but then, but, you know, marriage transcends beyond beauty. Or somebody being handsome. Because at some point, when you get married, you don't see, you don't see the outward individual anymore, you begin to see the inner person. And that, if that inner person is not character or does not align with the spirit of God, my brother, my sister, you are going to have issues. You know. The second thing again, again that will cause my daughter is a broken family altar. A family altar that is broken. What's that, what's that altar? An altar is the place where we all come together to worship, to praise God, to read the word of God. If the family altar is broken, whereby the man, the wife, the children are not coming together, my brother, my sister, is a recipe for crisis. For marital crisis. That's why we must come together, hold our hands together, to begin to present things to God in the place of prayer. Don't get me wrong. My wife is on my neck every day. When are you bringing us together? When are you bringing us together? So please, I'm not coming here presenting the holier than that attitude. I'm also talking to myself. But we must be deliberate and intentional to repair that, that altar, family altar that is broken. The other one again is what I call the demon of strife. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 15, verse 18. Proverbs 15, 18. You see, a rotten man steps up strife, but he who is slow to anger allays contention. 
My brother, my sister, strife is a demon. Strife would destroy the family. And that's why we, we all, as believers, we need to make effort to separate ourselves from that demon of strife. Because strife can never bring about the glory, the mercies, and the miracles of God. Proverbs, uh, sorry, James chapter 4, 1 and 2. He said, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? Verse 2. He said, you lost and, and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not uh, ask. The strivings, the, 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 the strife, the quarrels, the contention between husband and wife. Where is it coming from? My brother, my sister, when it comes like that, you must realize that it's a satanic attack and you must deal with it accordingly. Because Satan does not want marriages to try. John chapter 10, verse 10. He said, The thief does not come except to what? Steal and to kill and to destroy. He said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it what? More abundantly. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verses 7 and 8. He said, I have six servants on horses. He said, Why princes walk on the ground world like servants? You know, why princes walk in the, in the ground like servants? Verse 8. He said, He who digs a pit will fall into it. And whoever breaks through a wall will be beaten by a serpent. Another version of the scripture says, whoever uh, breaks the hedge, you know, will be beaten by a wall. My brother, my sister, in our marriages, in our relationships, you know, are we breaking the walls? Are we breaking the, 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 the hedges? How do we do that? When we refuse to come together, you know, to the family altar, and agree in the place of prayer. The other one, again, I want to talk about is, uh, there are so many points I have, but because of our time, I can't go through everything. Uh, infidelity. Let me talk about that. I will close. Infidelity. Everybody's looking at me. <laughs> what is infidelity? Some people don't know. If you are in a sexual relationship with somebody who is not your husband or wife, if you are married and you are in a sexual relationship with somebody who is not your husband or wife, that is what they call adultery. What is it called? Adultery. If you are in a sexual relationship with somebody, you are not married, you are in a sexual relationship with somebody who is not your husband or wife, that is what is called what? fornication. I tell you something, I say confidently, if you are here and you are still into adultery or you are into fornication, I'm telling you it will destroy your destiny. I'll give you a story. Everybody knows this story. It's sad. Toronto. How many people know Toronto here? Yeah. How many people know John Tory? <laughs> Great mayor. Excellent. I love him. John Tory has a, a good pedigree. Is, is it what they call it? Pedigree, the courage or something? No? Pedigree, exactly. His grandfather was, was a very good friend of Ted Roger, the founder of Roger. Then his own father, lawyer, Barry. Excellent. Very articulate. What happened? One day he came on the news, breaking news. Uh, well, I apologize to everybody. Uh, not me. Uh, well, I'm going to resign as mayor of Toronto. Because, because of one night. You know, one man of God says something. Is it one man of God or maybe Abraham Lincoln says something? He said, if your neighbor is being flogged and you're not feeling the pain, then you are a fool. He we just with a stupid decision, a stupid relationship, he lost everything. His legacy is now in disarray. Somebody who has done so well. My brother, my sister, you know, if you are in an illicit relationship, you are in a relationship with somebody who is not your husband and wife, that is what you are doing to your, to your legacy in the realm of the spirit. So be careful. Be careful. Be careful. First Corinthians chapter 6, 15 and 16. 
He said, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? She said, shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? He said, certainly what? Not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? Listen, this is not Pastor Tonio. This is the Bible. He said, for the two, he says, shall be called what? One flesh. One thing is that if you sleep with someone, do you know that you have slept with everybody that that person has slept with? My brother and my sister, I tell you something, and I say confidently, infidelity will destroy your marriage. Your wife might not know, your husband might not even know, but in the realm of the spirit, you're not picking up a good legacy. You see, one thing I found out that it might not even be a sexual relationship. It might be an emotional relationship. Because there are things you are supposed to be telling your wife that you are telling this other lady in the office. Or there are things that you are supposed to be confiding to your husband you are telling this other guy in, at, at your workplace. Casual relationship. Nice. You know, I, when, I remember when, <laughs> a long time ago, I had this um, Indian lady that was my friend. My, she was my colleague. I noticed that when we all go for group lunch, she likes eating from my own plate. I said, no, <laughs> this, this has to stop. <laughs> I said, no, no. I, in fact, I cut her off immediately. Because I record it. No, I'm not saying she meant anything, but I, I mean, I did. I could not just imagine you have your own plate. You want to come and eat from mine. Nothing. But what I'm trying to say is that this, these are the little things that you need to discover. That you need to, if you don't cut it off, you know, at some point, you don't know from eating from your plate, the next day again, both of you are holding hands in the back. The next day again, you are, you know, so, everybody shouting. <laughs> So we need to be careful. Somebody is not your husband, he's not your husband. Somebody is not your wife, not your wife. There are certain things that you're not supposed to share with somebody who is not your wife. There are certain things you're not supposed to share with somebody who is not your husband. I'm not saying don't have friends, have friends, but we need to maintain boundaries. So then, how do we become one flesh? Very quickly. We need to go back to the first principles. We need to re revisit and ensure a godly foundation is in place. First of all, the first thing is that there has to be mutual submission to each other and to the will of God. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7. He said, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. He said, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My brother, my sister, we all need to go back. So when you fear the Lord, I tell you something, you will depart from evil. You will not even think about it, that you need to, uh, you know, at times I wonder, they say the person committed adultery, how did he get there? Adultery is not just you touch somebody, you commit adultery now. There are certain steps that precede, is that not so? Maybe there's a lunch, there's a dinner, there you go to, the so before, in all these steps, nothing cautioned you that, look, you, you are on the wrong path. You know, the second thing they get is that we must build a godly family altar in the place of prayer, intense worship, and diligent study of the word of God. First Peter chapter 5, 7 to 10. He said, cast it all your care upon him, for he cares for you. He said, be sober. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He said, resist him, step fast in the faith, knowing that the same suffering are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. He said, but may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered the world, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. But there's someone here at the, I'm speaking at the moment. You are, you are going through a raging marital storm. But the scripture says that after you have suffered a while, God will perfect you. He will strengthen you. He will settle you. You will sing a new song. Yeah. Who is that person? Put your hand together for Jesus. Yeah. I'm rushing because of our time because we need to, please, we might take 10 minutes extra from 12.30. Sorry about that. The other one is that we need to forgive each other and let go of the past. You know, my wife, she, said she, she, she has written a book called The Glory of Forgiveness. I was joking with her. I said, you must write a book on the power of forgiveness. This morning, she sent me the book. <laughs> surprise, surprise, surprise. 
You know, my wife will hunt you. You must forgive the person. Must forgive the person. Say me forgive that person. Oh, what the person did? But my brother, my sister, forgiveness heals. Forgiveness brings about restoration. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 4, 31 and 32. Ephesians chapter 4, 31 and 32. It says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. It says, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgive one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Uh, my slide, thank you. Let's quickly rush. Then, finally, I have a lot of points, but we don't have the time. Do not entertain a sexual relationship or an emotional affair outside your marriage. That is critical. Did everybody hear that? And for the young ones, you know, I tell you, wait. By the time you get married, you can have it 24-7. I don't know why you're so much in a hurry. <laughs> yeah, look at me. You know, and you see, the, the funny thing about, about sex is the fact that you know, but then you now have the license to have it. You don't want to even have it anymore. You are, I mean, <laughs> because you know it's not just there for you. So why are you in a hurry? Because I'll tell you something. Sex before marriage is going to alter your destiny. Do we want to rise up as champions and begin to talk with the most high God? Yes. 